Welcome to Burning Platforms, a fortnightly podcast from the Australia Institute's Centre for Responsible Technology. I'm Peter Lewis. This week, we'll be diving deep into children's digital safety with activist Chloe Shorten. But first, our regular wrap of the latest tech news with Digital Rights Watch Chair Lizzie O'Shea and Guardian Australia's Josh Taylor. Let's kick it off, Josh, with what I can only describe as the geopolitics of tech, which is the TikTok inquisition that's been going on in the US Congress. Um, The head of um, TikTok took evidence and quite hostile evidence from um, both sides of the the house. Um, What did we learn and what do we think is going to happen next? I mean, what we learned is probably not a huge amount, except I think that there's probably fairly, you know, for for the US Congress, there's fairly bipartisan support for cracking down a little bit on TikTok. Um, It seems like there's potential legislation that could potentially either result in TikTok having to move all its uh, operations to America and become an American company or... um, be blocked in in the US entirely, and um, yeah, it's, it's just been a couple of interesting weeks. And I think we're probably you know you, you see similar things sort of happening in the US and the UK, in Australia and the UK as well, in terms of just like this concern about the impact of this app and what privacy and security issues it may bring, and and I think just broadly what impact it's having. Um, it I think it's kind of interesting. So I wouldn't I I think. What we saw in the US this week was just, it's one of those things like we, we, we have seen the platforms hold before Congress and told that they're doing a terrible job broadly. And they, these are American companies who've seen Meta and and Twitter and, and all these sorts of companies hold before them before. But I think the interesting factor here is that you've got an app like TikTok, which has become one of the most popular apps in the world. Uh, it has it is changing culture in a lot of ways because you know everything from music to um movies and what videos go viral online now is now shaped by tiktok and i think that is probably where a lot of the nervousness is coming from from americans as well because it is not an american app so they're you know it's a little bit outside of their control now and i think you know in the coming weeks and months we're probably going to see what changes will, will happen and whether it'll stick around and whether or whether they'll go to, down the road of complete ban They've already banned government employees mm-hmm. from having TikTok on their phone. Yep. The discussion now is whether TikTok needs to divest from ByteDance and any ties with the Chinese government. What is What would those banning it say the problem they're trying to solve is? They're essentially arguing that as a Chinese company, uh, it is beholden to Chinese national security law, which means they can provide a lot uh, a, a lot of information about the users and, and you know, there have been stories that have come out about, uh, you know, potential key logging of journalists um, and, and location information being shared and stuff like that. And that is basically where the cause of concern is is arising from. And they're basically saying that if you make it an American company, then it no, would no longer be uh, subject to these laws. It, there'd be clearer sort of management oversight through the U.S., uh, you'd have the First Amendment and all that sort of stuff as well. But I think the probably <laughs> the the thing that is not said about this is that once it's an American company, American laws apply to it too. So although there is a lot of concern about the impact of Chinese laws, there are a lot of you know the the um, all the laws passed post September 11 are also major concern. But I guess those who are wanting to ban it would say there are better rules in place that make it more like less concerning. I guess from their point of view than under the current Chinese ownership. Yeah, do you see massive differences, Lizzie, between the perceived risks of um, backdoors into TikTok and the backdoors that exist in most of the American platforms? Yeah, this I think is the point because Karen Andrews is out there saying, oh, we need to ban TikTok from government phones and I think potentially saber rattling for something similar to what's going on in the US. I mean, I should say the draft legislation in the US is incredibly invasive and incredibly broad ranging. It basically targets any kind of device that might you know, go near the internet and allows them to to ban it, to, you know, um, gain access to um, its 
functionality, things like this, which is just goes far beyond the kind of um, concerns that normally are being raised by um, leaders in this charge um, to ban TikTok. Uh, so that's one thing. But I think there is an interesting question here because, of course, if we're talking about Australian sovereignty, uh, of, of course there's a risk that a Chinese-owned company might be subject to, um, you know, the whims of the Chinese Communist Party in terms of uh, giving access to data. But we also have on our phones used by government, obviously everyday people as well as representatives regularly use American companies that have been known to are on the record for having shared information um, with the American government on the regular. Uh, and so a lot of that posturing by someone like Karen Andrews feels a bit disingenuous to me. I'm up for definitely having a debate about how platforms share information with government. And I do think the concerns raised about TikTok, there's legitimacy there. You know, there were employees that were targeting journalists. I mean, TikTok say that they've disciplined those employees, but essentially looking to identify them. It's not a uh, far-fetched idea that they would share information with the Chinese government, just as we know from Edward Snowden that, of course, many American companies did that with the US government. So I think I'm, I'm up for having a debate about how we can stop private entities sharing information that they've collected from their users with government uh, in inappropriate ways or without transparency or accountability. But this is not what this current discussion is about. And you know, we've been talking, Pete, trying to come up with a good term for this, whether it's like cold, uh, some kind of cold warfare uh, in a digital format. Uh, I still haven't come up with one, so maybe that's the the challenge for those in the chat today, what kind of terminology we could use to describe it. But it does feel like a, a front in a cold war, essentially, between the US and China. And Australia, once again, has got an ally in the US, um, but then a lot of these debates then about user privacy or, or supposedly protecting privacy um, become a bit disingenuous, I think, uh, in a context in which we we don't have Australian companies that are that are that we could use or we could somehow rely on um, as an alternative to foreign companies. There's been a, a, a range of hot takes around the internet about um, the, this move. Um, one of which I found interesting: the Huff Post. It actually still exists, at least in America. <laughs> um, banning TikTok will stifle Gen Z's engagement with democracy, the impact being that um, unless you can get it into a shareable thing that you can dance to, you're not going to engage young people in you, the political you, process. You don't agree with that, Peter? I sort of, I think there's some merit in that argument. Well, it was also very interesting the degree to which young creators in the States are protesting against what, what's being proposed by the legislators. But I thought I'd bring Chloe in. And on your spectrum of concerns for kids where does um tiktok and chinese state surveillance sit pretty much with um the rest of the content of anything that my kids are using i have three kids from 21 now kids goes to 25 we were just <laughs> discussing this earlier these days adolescence goes to 25 so i have a 21 20 year old and a 13 year old and as part of that i've really spanned a generation in terms of use of products and what I get concerned about with respect to TikTok is the usual concerns, I think, the children's privacy and uh, children's mental health advocates that I've spoken to are talking about content. What is in the content? What are they actually seeing? How do they serve it up? What do we know? And choice. So consent is sort of further down the track. You've got to know what you're consenting to. And any of the content on TikTok, TikTok is that is... Uh, recommending using, um, you know, recommenders and uh, tools that create dark patterns for kids is a concern to me. So that's my concern rather than spying and, you know, espionage. And Josh, just to round this out, we did note that ASPI, which um, is the um, think tank on strategic policy in Australia, some people are interested in their links into mm -hmm. defence and other parts of that ecosystem are putting their have their Sydney dialogue next week if Australia was ever going to be announcing um they're following the US path on this that's probably something to watch out for next week yeah I mean I think it's fair to describe Aspi as fairly hawkish on China um and you know you've got the Home Affairs Minister who she received the report from her department a couple of weeks ago regarding what should be done about not just TikTok but a range of social media apps on on government devices and I think that, that that will probably be where they announce that there will probably be a move to ban it. And I think based on the, the sort of feelers I put out in terms of state governments as well, you'll probably end up seeing um, at least New South Wales and Victoria following suit, but I wouldn't be surprised if the other states followed through. There's like 
I mean, it's, it's, it's a fairly sensible move anyway, because apart from if you are, uh, you know, doing the social media for a certain department, there's really no reason for you to have TikTok on your work phone anyway. But I think that that ultimately comes down to whether people are more and more nowadays making their work phone also their personal phone. But I think it, particularly when it comes to government, that raises, raises a whole bunch of other issues as well. Yeah. Lizzie, um, the other bit of commentary around the, the TikTok press last week was that it was occurring in the States at a time when their privacy law reform process seems a little bit more about, despite the best intentions of the incoming Biden government, it's coming up against a whole lot of blockages. Um, we've also in Australia got um, the deadline today, Friday, if you're listening to this um, live um, for submissions into our privacy review. Um, where do you think that kind of notion of policing platforms and building the systems for better privacy intersect? I am a self about devotee of privacy because I think privacy is kind of, um, well, it's the gateway to a whole range of other rights. But I do also think it's trying to stop the data-driven business model at its um, at its origins. Because if you can stop social media platforms having free access, for example, to people's personal information and being able to use that, being able to turn it into curated audiences for advertising, that stops the motivation to keep people on the platform, um, you know, which gives rise to polarisation, to, to um, an incentive for disinformation, to continue that engagement. So I do think prior Privacy is not just about uh, people hiding away from scrutiny. It's also being able to participate in public life without being watched by commercial entities as well as public ones. And um, you're right. So if you want to put in a submission and you've, uh, you haven't got much time, you can go to Digital Rights Watch's website. We've got a template one for you if you if you like our views and sets out what we think about privacy reform. But it's really critical that we update our laws because we're just decades out of date. In the US, there's a, um, clearly a tussle going on. There's a number of different uh, reforms that have taken place at a state level, and then there's talk of a federal overarching piece of legislation. And of course, um, one of the good things about that would it would mean that those who are currently not um, enjoying protections at the state-based level would have federal protection. But of course, there's a catch to that as well, which is it might mean some of the more advanced privacy protections in places like California would then be subjected to the federal regime which might be less beneficial to those people in those states. And so there's an interesting kind of tussle going on between the feds, feds and states there, but also just huge amounts of resources by um, technology companies devoted to trying to stop key aspects of reform. And mostly they tend to be around stopping people being able to bring actions for invasions of privacy or interferences with privacy, um, as well as more generally stopping, um, you know, collection and, and uh, I guess, analysis or, or um, mixing of data for the, for the capacity then to create more targeted advertising. And what, that's one of my kind of disappointing things, I think, that's come out of the latest round of, of review in Australia, that there is a proposal to allow targeted advertising to take place in a regulated format. And I think most people don't really like targeted advertising. They see it as a problem. And I would hope in Australia we could get to a place where we start to call that out and stop it rather than assuming it's an important part of our economy and letting it occur mm. in a more regulated format. But, yeah, that's that's my two cents. Josh, um, with the privacy reforms in Australia, is it getting on the radar of your newsrooms yet or is it still seen as something that's over the horizon? I mean, I think Latitude Financial definitely helped bring it up yeah, to yeah, people's yeah. attention again um, to a degree. I think that's probably where people are probably going to be focusing their attention. Um, it would depend on like the next sort of the data breaches and stuff like that. And I think the responsibility for that. Um, but yeah, it, it really just gets, it tends to just get bundled in with um with whatever the latest data which is because that's where that's where it yeah. is front of mind for most people in terms of who has their data how is it being stored how long is it being stored and all that sort of stuff yeah it's it's kind of frustrating isn't it because it's it, it's very much there's the horse bolting and then the door attempting to be closed after that event and there were some initial tough penalties that were brought down at the end of last year but this this review is meant to be the systemic um, mm. re-thinking um, of the way our data is held that has been 40 years in the making. Chloe, I know you've been preparing a submission as well. There are particular questions in this, these reforms about how we should um, treat kids and, and, and what parts of kids' online activity should be able to be collected and um, exploited um, without taking us through your whole um, submission, what's the, um, the the thrust of what you'd like the government to be thinking about in that regard? Um, the best interests of the child. 
So when it comes to digital technology, privacy data, I'm really going to leave the adult stuff to the adults. So with the adults gaming, the adults watching porn and the adults watching whatever content they want, that's one thing because their brains, their synapses have joined up and they can make those decisions. So this is really about my focus is being on the kids. I think we need a robust, very robust set of codes. I think the self-regulation is um, not working. I think that um, you shouldn't be able to steal kids' data and uh, hurt kids with it in years to come. And my concern is that we're raising a generation of kids who are going to have a digital rap sheet by the time they leave school or reach majority where they can't erase, correct, um, or, you know, really have any control or agency over every misstep and mistake they've made in their childhoods. We all enjoyed the ability to stuff up uh, in privacy. And so that very early concept of privacy is so crucial to kids' well-being. We wouldn't pop, you know, two cars sitting outside the front of our house looking with guys in it or women looking through the window at every move our children are making, um, you know, and writing it all down and taking that content back to back to head office. And yet that's essentially what's happening with the way in which um, the privacy laws, I suppose, or regulatory environment is set up. Yeah, Lizzie, just to round out this discussion before we move on, um, expectations are high that the government's going to land something meaningful. What do you think needs to happen between now and the point of legislation? Um, well, look, I think there's a lot of potential distraction for the current federal government, unfortunately, in other fields of public debate. Um, but to be honest, I get calls every single time there's a data breach from various media outlets asking me what people can do, if I can come on and talk about it and like you know like we've talked about it's a bit frustrating because the horse has already bolted but what I say is we need to agitate for privacy reform so I think and there is a bit of pressure on the federal government even if they don't particularly want to put it to the top of their priority list these data breaches are going to continue happening because at the moment we have a regulatory environment that does not require companies to focus on data minimization and in fact companies feel that there's some benefit in keeping data in case they can wring commercial insights out of it um, and they don't see the downside of that they don't treat it like a to toxic asset um, they they actually just hold it and hoard it and until that changes I think we're going to continue to see quite um, quite disastrous data breaches uh, and the only thing I think that the government really can do in this environment is to reform privacy law in a bold manner that focuses on data minimization and and that's then their political cover as well for when um, companies you know invariably face these kinds of challenges they can at least say well the regulatory environment has made this clear that it's not acceptable to have poor cyber security and poor data management um, and so I'm sort of hoping that's the that's the matrix of um, reasoning they go through to get to the point where they're committed to making these reforms. Uh, and until then, I'll just have to keep telling people that if they want to do something about experiencing a data breach, they should just have for privacy reform. It's a good record, but it's one that you've got on high rotation. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll round out the in the news with a story that, that caught my eye more because it made me remember that the very first report the Centre for Responsible Technology put out was on this exact issue, which was getting um, an appropriate set of classifications for games. Um, Michelle Rowland, who's the new comms minister, um, has said that she will move to apply an 18, R18 plus rating to all video games which contain simulated gambling as part of a proposal targeted at restricting kids' access to popular casino games, um, but also an M rating on games where there are loot boxes, which is like your Fortnites, but also your FIFA soccer's, where you've got an element of risk to that is involved in the purchase of avatars or or little rewards or whatever and I'd noticed this first when my my son was sort of going down that wormhole pre-pandemic and I got really interested in the research behind it um the 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 notions of that um the the heightened stimulation you get when you've got a random um response to something so you've you've done a bet and then you you get the the early win and you want to keep going for longer and longer when we put it out there was cries there was house of nothingness. Um, it seems like this one is going through the process. Um, it, it does require states and territory agreement to proceed. I also note that Andrew Wilkie, the noted anti-gambling crusader, 
has been calling for um, strengthening what Roland's put forward, particularly around the loot boxes and moving them up to the R18. I'll start with you, Lizzie. You've got kind of two hats as a digital rights campaigner and the chair of um, the Alliance for Gambling Reform. Um, I don't know if I've given you the right title there. You might just be on the board. But, like, do you see the connection between the two and where do you sit on this? Yeah, I totally see the connection between the two. You know, it's like people often really are really upset the way that children, um, when you talk to them about sport, can recite the odds for any particular football match, for example, uh, and that's the primary kind of method through which they think about this the sport or it's the gate through which they understand it. And I think that a lot of games that have financial rewards built into them look a lot like gambling and uh, it inculcates a kind of way of participating in um, play and fun activity that also adds a financial element to it. It's essentially, I think, grooming kids for gambling over the long term as well as making money for the game producers in the short term. And I think there's there's a lot of work to do in terms of regulating this. I also have to say, I reckon we're at an interesting moment in gambling reform. The recent New South Wales election was um, had this issue front and centre, which is kind of astonishing because that's never really happened in New South Wales before. They've had decades of some of the most intense gambling in the country. Fifth of the world's poker machines, for example, are in New South Wales. And Australians lose more per capita than any other country in the world to gambling. So it's a massive problem in this country. And I think we need to get on top of it particularly at the start of the pipeline, because that's how gambling companies know they'll they'll recruit long-term customers. And, yeah, so I, I do think this warrants attention. Um, I don't think games should be about money per, per se. I'm not actually um, a complete, I'm not opposed to gambling per se, but I, I actually think problematic gambling does come from grooming people to have an association between play and financial reward, and we shouldn't really be permitting that to occur, with, mm. with, particularly when children are using these games. Yeah, I find the, the the idea that 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 I, I want to understand more is that it's not just about at the front whether it looks like a casino, but whether the architecture is set up to to randomise those rewards. Um, Chloe, you you're pointing out that the Lancet has actually put out um, a fresh paper on the link between um, games and gambling and kids' safety in a bit of a first. Yeah, the, the Lancet doesn't usually editorialise on this because they really need sort of definitive causation. But this is a new thing that's come out in the last week where essentially they're saying that, um, you know, they're very concerned that regulation uh, as it stands is not doing anything to um, address the violent um, content in video games and, and the relationship in children, in children, um, particularly, you know, they were looking at 16 to 13 year olds, sorry, six to 13 year olds, a very vulnerable cohort of kids. And as Lizzie says, you know, you're setting up a new market for future, whatever those products or behaviours are, addictive behaviours, etc. But they've really found some strong links between the screen violence time, watching screen violence for a long time, participating in it, and increased bullying and cyberbullying. So for the first time, they've found a really direct correlation between those two things, and that was done over a huge number of um, studies on all of them, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, the, the, the platform-enabled games in particular. But, you know, this is an age-old argument. that We have been talking about this sort of stuff since we were concerned about, you know, the Kelly gang. The story of the Kelly gang in the early 1900s was the first, the first violent content on a, on a screen that Australians saw. And, you know, fast forward years later, I remember in the early 1980s, um, my mum was doing an um, inquiry uh, for the Human Rights Commission and asked me to tell my story about um, being 14 or whenever, whatever I was and seeing porn that was so aggressive and so violent at a sleepover at a friend's place, you know, it was a parent's porn, um, and the damage that that did. It was... Uh, Interestingly enough, the Commonwealth censor at the time was John Dickey, one of those lovely um, moments of um, uh, nomers, not misnomers. <laughs> he did some wonderful work batting off the vested interests, largely at the time, who were saying censorship, censorship, you know, you're getting in our way of developing our, um, our profits. But, it, but at the end of the day, you know, we need to be doing a lot more about knowing what's in this stuff, what it, what is in these products, and what how what's the impact on kids. Josh, what's your take on the? Um... Um, I'd be interested to see what sort of impact it has. I mean, it, it's interesting that they have gone for the M fifteen plus rating for loot boxes because that that ultimately means that kids can still ultimately get it um, 
via their parents buying it or something like that. Um, it's not quite MA, it's not quite R, but maybe it will make parents think, oh, what's actually in this game? It looks fairly innocent on the cover, but it will make them think a bit more about it. Um, I think more broadly in terms of like, we've been waiting for this classification review for like several years now and they have, they have picked the low hanging fruit. I think there's fairly, there's a lot of appetite for reform around loot boxes and, and gambling in games. And so I can understand why they did that first, but I think more broadly, there's a lot of other stuff in that re review that, that came along with the announcement that um, is worth considering and particularly how that is going to interact with the online safety act as well, because they're, they're in the process of de developing a bunch of codes about restricting access to stuff, age verification, all that sort of stuff as well. So I think we like it, this is a good start, but I think we need to have that broader discussion about what, like we're no longer in the VCR days. We're no longer in the, in the, um, late nineties when this, when this classification system was first developed, we need to actually sort of have a conversation that, that deals with how, what content is like on the internet now. We might take a bit of a deep breath where I'm um, halfway through the hour and move into our, our focus discussion, which is with Chloe Shorten. Um, now, most people would know Chloe from her public life. Um, I'm really interested, Chloe, what's brought you into this realm and what was the story that, that, that drew you into critically thinking about the way that tech platforms operate? Uh, thanks for having me, everybody. It's um, really lovely to be able to have an opportunity to contribute to this conversation. I, as a parent, was drawn into it when I first experienced some of the things that my kids were able to get access to. And as I said before, this is about children. My concern is about children who can't consent, who can't understand some of the decisions that they're making because on their behalf, parents don't know what's inside the box. So we, uh, you know, there were things that kids were able to see and get access to, regardless of heeding all of the advice that was given to us by the safety people, the e-safety people, the digital, you know, parenting people. We were watching everything they were doing. There were no devices in the bedrooms. You know, we had, Bill and I went out and got a small safe from Bunnings. <laughs> and Bunnings sells more tiny safes for locking up kids' devices than for any other reason. So we this bought is one like, too, I've just got to say. Yeah. So, you know, this is a fight that we're too, having, <laughs> having a fight, a collective fight against a lot of this stuff um, coming down the pipe at our kids. And then we sort of turned a corner, I suppose. I wanted to understand what my kids were looking at, how I could help them, how I could help them dis discern things properly, as opposed to just censoring all the time and becoming this policewoman. And uh, so I started writing about that. I was writing about uh, the impact of porn on kids and um, researching that with a lot of people around the world, which has really been amazing. So um, no matter what privacy set settings and supervision we undertook, they were still vulnerable. And now we've got this bring your own device policy for education and schools that's been rolled out in the last you know, five to 10 years. That, uh, that has enabled um, children to be completely wired all the time and that means they are connected up to school school platforms other platforms by devices to know what sport they've got on to continue doing their homework to communicate with their um, teachers everything there were the separation of your school life which used to pretty much leave you know at the door at the gate of the school separating that life from your home life and your family life has been blurred now and we have got a range of different public health pressures on families dramas with conflict levels and stress levels in households children who are anxiety you know anxiety ridden there's so many harms that have been uh looked at and uh, I was luckily lucky enough to bump into Reese Farthing from Reset who gave me some really incredible um understanding of how the technology does actually compromise our kids and exploit our kids in a way that they say they don't you know and that, and that was a real concern to me because you, this can't always be about um, consumer protection and it can't always be about parents having to be the, the last bastion of the children you know you know now we've got vaping which is all over platforms and it's there in a second you know it's not filtered or regulated out in any way 
so that's sort of how I came to it. But the, the home learning stuff and education tech was absolutely supersizing the problem a couple of years ago as a result of COVID. And the when you look at the when you follow the money, you follow the venture capital into education technology at that time and the penetration, the speed at which we had to try to keep our kids learning. You know, we all took our eye off what was actually going on. And I feel bad about that as a parent and as a um, as a writer about family issues. And, you know, the kids are suddenly tethered to all of these products and potential harms because they were being exploited and by, by these tech products, which actually do follow and track their personal information and their personal data, whether it's technical information or whatever, it's still personal and potentially really harming kids. So I kind of came to that from a, I looked at the privacy impact assessments, for example, in detail that were going on at my kids' schools with all the products that they had. 21 apps for one of my kids. Suddenly, my kid is connected to 21 apps. I went through forensically with a privacy law specialist, each one of their um, terms and conditions and the things you tick off and the kids tick them off and the teachers tick them off on your behalf. And yet underneath them, were pixels and SDKs and technical tools that were doing the exact opposite of what they had on the packaging and what they were saying they were doing. And when you look at how venture capital came in with hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars um, at a, in a very short period of time because they were getting access to insights. I go, what's insights? And insights is personal data about the kids. Once I started talking to parents about it, they just were gobsmacked. Yeah. And, and, and it feels really, it feels like another disempowering experience for parents. So Yeah, it, it's very much a case that for every parent, they are engaging with a very complex system with not much of a sense of navigation. Um, I also note that a lot of the take up of tech in schools appears to be vendor driven. You know, the early, the early setup of computer labs were replaced by bring your own device and then you've got to go out and buy it and then sort of work out all the settings on the computers um, for your kids, which they can then work better than you can. So there's no real way of creating those guardrails. Um, I'm interested in what the response has been, particularly from educators, because I do think that the industry's done a great job of convincing teachers that this has improved the quality because, you know, you can access all the information in the world now. Like, So have you had any purchase with educators with your work? It's interesting, the teachers that I've spoken to, and I've got, my, you know, my best friend and her husband are teachers, and um, so we have been talking about this quite some time. The, the issues around teachers, are they are just desperately trying to get that content and the curriculum covered with their kids. And they are being given the tools which are being del delivered to them by the administration of their school and the education departments. So at the same time, they're not necessarily getting the opportunity to do, what do you call it, insourcing or, you know, where they're teaching teachers about digital and data rights and um, how to um, manage those when they're given a new tool, which are, which are sold to those teachers based on, you know, what are the opportunities this digital amazement can give our kids? So I don't blame them. I think I'd be interested to know what are the education unions doing to help their teachers get across these things and what are the administrators of independent and, and public schools doing as well? How are they taking their decisions? Because some of those technology platforms are seriously concerning and the assessment is usually done by the people, the, the self-assurance uh, model of assessing the security of these products. I'm hoping that the privacy impact assessment for high-risk activities in the privacy review report recommendations will help us with this one. What, what is the responsibility of government though, Chloe, as well? Because um, it's one thing to say, yeah, I mean, I appreciate unions, I think, have a role to play here in terms of facilitating a discussion about what can make educators' life uh, better and also allow children to learn the skills they need. Um, and I do wonder whether, you know, government gets a bit beholden to some of the sparkly new tech and try to implement it and integrate it whenever they can in, 
yeah, in any yeah. appropriate and, ways. And, yeah. and I think that's happened at a state level for a range of different reasons. One of them is a governance issue around how the schools are actually set up to do these purchases. So you've got largely two organisations, you've got Microsoft and Google are the ones that have the major platforms. Cisco plays somewhere in the middle um, as the sort of third force in the competitive environment of the platforms for schools and then above that you've got the tech stack of you know dozens if not hundreds of apps that are available and how they're assessed that privacy impact assessment of those products should be the responsibility of education departments around the country and there are some uh, there's only one state I think it's only Queensland that has a um, sort of purchasing um, assessment that goes through the education department itself. So a lot of schools go directly, uh, they're actually approached directly by the vendors. And so they have to do their own privacy impact assessments. How do they do that? Who, who is it that's doing that on these um, councils, the school councils? And, um, you know, currently there's one organisation that does the privacy impact assessments that's made up of state government bodies in an advisory capacity that apparently assesses ed tech products based on a traffic light system. But as Ed Santow showed me in with those products, the there's no accountability as to who's actually, you don't know or have any transparency over who is actually doing those assessments. And most of them are self-assessed. So you could have some big, you know, private equity, majority owned ed tech company that's desperate for insights that it resells for <laughs> investment coming in and saying, oh, yes, well, our products are fine and they do do all these things because we are assuring you and that's the vendor assurance trap. So, you know, I agree with you absolutely that governments need to be completely all over this and right now because we unpacking, unpicking all that tech is really difficult to do. And, you know, the toothpaste is out of the tube. I don't know what I'm going to do when my kid gets old enough to ask for a phone. So um, I, mm -hmm. I don't mean, I mean, you guys have navigated this more than me and I, I don't mean to, to, to um, pre presume that I'll be any good at it. But one of the things I wonder about is I do think like I'm a bit, I, don't, I would like to get to a point where I never lock up a phone in a safe because I mm -hmm. partly think one of the key skills that you can give children in the 21st century is the capacity to, to learn how to disconnect themselves without being forced to. And there's, uh, like, learning that skill is not just a responsibility of parents. I also think it's not just um, the responsibility of government either. But I think part of it is that the product is designed to be really addictive and we That's can try right. like that. That's but right. it's also, it's also, like, I find these conversations sometimes challenging as well because the other thing I think is it's partly also having the opportunity to sit with your kid and have a meal with them every night and talk to them, which you might not be able to do if you have to work three jobs to, you know, pay your rent. And so, like, it's like um, talking about how the lived experience, the lived environment affects all public health concerns. It's kind of the same thing. Like, the digital environment, um, it does, it's, it's affected by lots of different policy interventions, including, you know, how much parents have to work, how much time they can spend with their Absolutely. children. Whether they, you know, The realities so, of it, Lizzie, I, I totally agree with you. I even wrote a book about sitting down with your kids at mealtime three times a week and what mm. that does for a child. Um, you know, they're 3,000 words more uh, by the time they start school in their vocabulary. They're much less likely to have risky behaviours, yada, yada. So there's all if you could these see what, If you could see what my child eats like, you would not want to do it. I'm yeah. just joking. But as I say, <laughs> really like, you're, for a week. <laughs> but Lizzie, your, your, your feedback to me on these issues has always been be a better parent, basically. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, but, and, and I totally get that. But it and if there wasn't the addiction by design mm. and the it's it's not like you're telling your kid to go out and go for a run no. to get fitter. There is something physically there is a counterweight for you being that good parent. And I reckon it's just like I, the chemicals in vapes, Peter. And it, you know, you can keep saying to your child, look, smoking's rubbish, it does this to you, da-da-da. You teach them all of the things about the public health impact, the personal health impact, all of those things. If they are being delivered, cool girl, you know, influencer, vaping, whatever you do, vaping, um, you know, on every other YouTube video or TikTok dance video or whatever they're seeing, you know, Alana Del Rey, for God's sake, in her latest video is vaping. Uh, when when um, Batman, uh, Colin Farrell, was doing his media interviews for Batman, he was vaping during the interview. So, oh, but everyone used to smoke as well. Sure, but you know we and know so better we. now, right? So yeah. what when what we're doing is we are replacing one addictive product with another addictive product, and 
no matter how good a parent you are, I think the burden on parents to be better parents is really, really breaking people. It's very stressful. You know, you can't just send in, well, a lot of the schools are sending in police into do education on e-safety and data and, you know, what your behaviours are online. But if you're being egged on with material that's deliberately designed to keep you behaving in a certain way, then that's the problem. Yeah, I mean, I don't mean to, I, I, sorry, I, I, I understand the answer is like be a better parent in what, or what that seems to be what I'm saying. But what I really mean is how do we give people the tools to become better parents like that? Yeah. And that there's lots of different things that we have to ch- challenge or, or Don't confront. you think that the tools, I agree with you, but don't you think the tools should be better products? At the end of the day, if you're selling a car and you're saying to everybody, um, actually, you can drive a car, but it doesn't have any seatbelts. Sorry, it's either that or no car. You know, we have been building things safely for a really long time. You want your kid to swim, you teach them to swim, you put up a fence, you have flags on the beach. There's nothing wrong with society getting together and designing better products for, you know, for our kids to use. We let them go on a bike or a scooter, but they have to wear a helmet. So presuming the parents are doing that baseline stuff, here's the product, do the safe stuff with it, teach them everything they need to know let them take risks, calculated risks, enjoy the digital world. But at some point we can't keep saying this is, you know, big tobacco all over again or asbestos or whatever. We don't know what's inside. So we can't tell, sorry, as in content, you know, if we don't know what's happening, if we don't know that these algorithms and techniques are designed to keep our kids coming back, in such a way that is so dangerous for them. This is full on Russian roulette. This is absolute public health ticking time bomb. But I was just going to ask you regarding the um, education apps as well. Um, have you have you sort of heard from any parents in terms of are they seeing their kids being targeted as a result of these apps, or do you think that at the moment they're just basically hoovering up all this information that that you know as you were talking later, like a digital rap sheet that they might use it to target kids as they sort of progress through through life. There are harms that have been identified. The ones about AI in particular, the big disaster that happened a couple of years ago with the A-levels in the UK and where they got all the data of the kids. They put one data set together with another one. The first data set was their results. The second data set was their postcode. Mm -hmm. There were three levels up for those who were in particular postcodes and three levels down for those Sorry, results. So they so they got them to, they just basically used the AI to give them results so they didn't have to sit the test during COVID. The results was discrimination, actual harm caused. There were literal protests outside the school. The government had to repeal that. They had to take, take it back and then standardise their results based on taking out that, that data. There was another example with some schools in Holland. There's um, been some recent... Uh, um, information that suggests we're going to have consumer law action, um, which is where Catherine Kemp's great work is in this. And um, I know that, um, Lizzie, you know Catherine's work well, and I, um, I'm, I'm amazed to see how there's a kind of consumer law work around here about misleading conduct and consumer law in terms of the harms for kids. So it's about how does the data get stored? How much needs to be stored? What can be um, deleted? You know, there's, there, are, there are things that, that the, the regulation can provide us that will help us uh, as parents to prevent discrimination, you know, bullying stuff. Data leaks of information that happened in the US where a 10-year-old girl's data was leaked via school and she ended up having people taking out multiple credit cards in her name. She was 10 years old. So the harms are piling up. And the regulatory, you know, recommendations aren't really that scary, you know, in terms of, in terms of, uh, you know, preventing harms, they seem pretty simple to me, but I'm just, I'm not a legislator. I'm just a mum. <laughs> Although you've um, put a fairly, um, you know, <laughs> comprehensive set of us in front of um legislators and you know That's a few true. of them. Um, what sort of things are you, are you pushing for, Chloe? Uh, ooh, how long have you got? Um, I uh, We need to include the best children's best interests in the fair and reasonable tests. Um, I have a blended family and I've been through family law and I know what it's like to have children's best interests as the fundamental principle of family law in terms of 
access, you know, responsibility for the child. That's for underpins family law. It's interesting the Attorney General is focusing on two areas regarding children. Commonwealth Attorney General, he's looking at the Family Law Act in terms of best interest tests for the child and now privacy for children in the best interest of the child. So I think we need to really understand what we're looking for in terms of best interest. I think we need a children's online privacy code that's got to cover all the services that are likely to be accessed by children. Um, and uh, I think the government, here we go, this is the first time I've ever done this. I think the government should. <laughs> 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 Stop, but seriously, that is the first time I have ever done that. <laughs> I mean, 15 years of political spoustum. I think the government could adopt a principles-based framework that service providers must have regard to when applying the Privacy Act requirements to situations involving children. Then I think we need to require data impact assessments if you're engaging in large-scale processing of kids' data. And, and I actually, Digital Rights Watch gave me some of that as did Reset. Thank you very much. Um, a prohibition on kids using on using kids' data for behavioural advertising. Please. It's so simple. And if a company uses, collects, stores, shares, profiles, personal information about kids, they have to disclose this. Most privacy policies, I've got four big massive folders of all the privacy policies of all of the apps that one of my children uses. Not one of them actually says what it does. The workarounds there are so elaborate and so uh, it really is, uh, you know, uh, in my prior life I worked in competition law in big mining companies and it, it would make an ACCC lawyer just squirm to see them. I'm sure they've seen them, but it's astonishing. So it's a very simple sort of set of requests that, you know, specific compliance requirements for kids' personal information could be dealt with by taking that principle but principles-based approach. And I'm hoping that nobody's like totally disagreeing with me there. Oh, I, I, I completely agree with you, Chloe. My only objection is I sort of think these things should apply to everyone, not just kids, but I, um, you know, that that's common ground. I don't think that's prob probably, I mean, I, I don't think um, that warrants a kind of expression of disagreement. The only kind of concern I have- If I did that though, Lizzie, if I went in on the auspices of anything outside my remit, which is you know, I'm not a specialist in the law. I'm not a specialist in the technology. I'm a politician's wife. If I go anywhere near it other than my core business, which is being a mum, I can't do that. I would oh, completely. Say, and also there's utility in starting somewhere. And I think children, people recognise children have a specific kind of vulnerability yeah. and that, um, you know, if there's a high standard, maybe it lifts all boats. Like the GDPR is a high standard. It's kind of meant that it's lifted boats around the world because even if you're not subjected to it, you might want to have a uh, equivalence um, determination that allows you to trade more easily with the, with Europe. So I think, you know, any way to raise the standards of privacy is is a good thing. Um, but, you know, the the... For me, I think it, it should be more general, but I, I totally get what you're doing and I applaud it. I mean, the only kind of rub that I sometimes come up against in these spaces is um, around age verification, because this is what uh, we expect the online, the safety commissioner will propose in coming months or years. And I am a bit troubled by that because online age verification to get access to various um, apps or websites and the like it sounds good in theory but it does result in accumulation of personal information to verify that um, I, I haven't seen any proposals that really managed to do it in a way that I would feel comfortable with and I wondered if you had a view about it I don't I don't necessarily think you need to have ironclad online age verification in order to implement the proposals you're putting forward uh, but I, I have a, this suspicion that that's going to be on the agenda in, in coming um in the, in the medium term, and I wonder what you thought about it. I'm still getting my head around some of the nuances of it all. Um, my, my initial instinct is twofold. When we are talking about making some changes to something that make us feel a little bit uncomfortable because we know there's going to be a trade-off, we've been doing that forever. As parents, we do that all the time. And I do remember when, there's a bit of an anecdote, when uh, my father was advocating for pool fences and we had death threats and bombs petrol bombs thrown at our house in Brisbane by kids being removed from the house because of his advocacy. And he was an architect and designer, industrial designer. So he was actually in his, you know, bailiwick. And, you know, this was in the 70s. And there were so many vested interests in stopping that from happening. And yet there was a trade-off that had to happen because his three-year-old goddaughter walked out into the backyard of her family's pool, you know, backyard and walk, walked into the pool and drowned. 
So that personal experience led to massive reforms that created something that took that those drowning rates from stratospheric to almost negligible. And in along that process, we had to lose some things. And while I understand that, yeah, you know, you have to give some of this and take some of that, at the end of the day, it is about assessing what is the harm that we're trying to prevent and how, what are the tools to do it. I remember I, I watched Julian and Grant, um, our e-safety commissioner, being trolled by Elon Musk for saying at the World Economic Forum that she had that she thought that we needed to something like recalibrate the rights arguments around all of these um, discussions, you know, about age verification and all the different online safety work that's been going on around the world. And she was verbaled and taken out of context. What she was trying to say was, let's come together as a community, as society, and crack this nut together. And maybe we should be, you know, having this zero sum game binary argument. Um, so I think she's gutsy and I have a lot of faith in the people who've been working around that sort of area. I'm sure there will have to be compromises, but I've watched compromise in politics and in regulation create some really fantastic outcomes. So my fingers are crossed and I'm being optimistic because there's so much stuff going on that's really scary and we've got to do something about it. So I, I just don't want to be one of those people who scuttles the CPRS because they want the best of something. And that, that was a joke for Josh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's my, my big opinion coming at you. But you know what I mean? Letting the perfect get in the way of the important. Yeah, Josh, do you feel the drumbeat for this sort of reform? I mean, just in terms, it's it's coming along anyway, because there are deadlines set out from the e-safety commissioner anyway. I think that it probably feeds into uh, the other things that, that Chloe's been talking about. But it, it, it is interesting that... I don't think there's any one good option that the government will be presented with because you you end up in a stage where um, either you're requiring all the all these other companies to hold this data on you uh, on what you want to look at and access online if you want to implement this system, or you end up in another thing where you've got a gatekeeper that is in is ultimately responsible for all this data as well, and then it's basically a honeypot. So that's one of the big concerns. I think. I think the government is fairly cognizant of that. Um, I think that they're, you know, after what happened with Medibank and Optus, it's something that's front of mind. You know, we're, we're looking at the going down the path of some sort of potential digital identity at some point in time as well. Whether they try to integrate that into everything that's going on with the age verification thing, we'll have to wait and see. But I think from what I've seen from, from how Julia and Grant's been looking at it, she has been um, at least... Well, the, the, the advocates for, um, well, the people who are opposed to to age verification systems coming into effect say that they feel like they've been a little bit um, placated and not really listened to all that much through the discussions. But from the sort of the writing that eSafety have put up so far about how the discussions are going, it does seem that they're fairly cognizant that this is not going to be an easy thing to do. So I, I think, you yeah, know, there's a long way to go at, the, at this stage. Yeah, I mean, I think there can be too much focus on it as well because a lot of the things that, um, you know, you were talking about, Chloe, can be implemented. And even if, um, you know, if we create that high standard and then there's the capacity to hold, um, if the other reforms in the privacy act are introduced and there's capacity to hold um, companies accountable when they misuse information, when there's a particular vulnerability of the person whose information it is and, you know, uh, being a minor is potentially one of them. I think there's ways in which you could hold companies to account for, you know, falling foul of community expectations for how children will be treated in online spaces. Um, and so I just sort of hope that's the kind of more sensible approach that prevails rather than a, a more dictatorial kind of program that's difficult to implement technically and may come at a high cost. Yeah. Anyway, that's, my, that two, note, that's my big yeah. opinion, Chloe. So it's, it's, Bounce so around like like bubbles. You got one 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 minute right of reply yes. before we round off, <laughs> Chloe. Oh, I'm actually agreeing with a lot of the, the concerns that um, that Lizzie says. I I think that there was some stuff in that very early metadata bill that you know we need to revisit in general. But when it comes to you know the kids, essentially we don't we've only got one shot at this, and I think that that with our windows closing. The, most parents say the rules should be stricter, there should be tighter regulations and that we just shouldn't have, you know, 
Adults don't need to be protected from the dangers of their own capacity to identify and understand potential harms. But if we allow that to happen to kids right now, when we know better and we've seen things um, happen in other uh, parts of, of our economy, then it's on us. And so I'm just really keen to understand, you know, as much as I can about what we can do right now. Um, so I'm still learning, like I'm reading everything all the time. It's driving my kids mad. At least they don't have to hear about porn at the dinner table all the time. <laughs> Thanks for being part of the day, today's discussion, Chloe. Um, there were a Thanks lot of reasons <laughs> to really be upset about um, the result of 2019, not the least, you know, tax concessions for the rich and SCOMO. But it would have been great to see you with a larger megaphone as well, but it's great to see you still um, contributing to the public debate. And um, we look forward to circulating more of your work over I was definitely right months. out there today, Peter, courtesy of you. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> Jordan has put us up. Um, to be part of South by Southwest, a live burning platforms, but it's a voting thing and there's hundreds of things up there. So we want to get 29 votes today and we'll also put it in the link to the podcast as well. But if you do want to vote for us, I don't even know. I think you just need to wear ripped jeans or something and you get, you get, a, you get a seat at that table. So it'd be good fun if we could pull it off. You've been listening to Burning Platforms. It was recorded in a live virtual town hall on March 30. If you want to attend one of our discussions, you can register at centreforresponsibletechnology.org.au. Burning Platforms was produced by Jennifer Macy on Gadigal Land. Speak again in a fortnight. <laughs>